Episode of the Monitor Keeping Podcast. I'm Alan Stevens here with Kai. How's it going, Kai. guys? Uh, today we're going to be talking about some cool stuff. We're going to get into caging, cage building. Uh, this might go into a second episode. We'll see just how far we get. And uh, but first off, of course, we want to say thank you to uh, NPR, uh, the Morelia Python Radio Network. I want to say thank you to Eric Burke for. Uh, for getting this all started for us and and letting us become a part of the network or part of the uh, basically under the umbrella with them so that we can bring you guys some some good content and honestly for us he's taken a lot of the guesswork out of things and continues to um, uh, assist us with just new new ideas uh little criticisms here and there things to add in or focus on so we really yeah, thank appreciate you, it thank you yep. thank you and again, um, go and check out their uh, their website, the Morelia Python Radio dot com. Uh, check out the different podcasts, of course, uh, NPR being the main one, and several other podcasts. And we'll talk more uh, about that at the end. But Kai, how you doing? Hey, not bad, not bad. I just uh, been you know re- just really busy, kind of nonstop. I'm just preparing for this stuff, preparing for my own um, grasshopper things and. Uh, monitor stuff, digging up eggs, worrying about gravid females, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, just uh, it's kind of nonstop. And also, uh, since the weather's been warmer, I've been moving out lizards. I'm not a big shipper during winter time, so um, I've been waiting for the weather to shift into gear. But to be honest, some states have been still cold. So yeah, it, sucks. it kind of sucks. It really does draw back, and it. It's kind of amazing how some of these places, like I'm at 90 degrees, but they're still snowing. So yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, this episode I really like to get into caging and not really just uh, just like what we do and um, what like the normal community does or what like our standard is, but we're trying to really get into how a, a typical beginner might want to set up. Um, and then like an inter- intermediate section and, and really get into um, slightly more developed section. And then as we're growing, I, I don't really want to put a stamp on what's top notch only because it, there's always um, evolving developments and th- stuff like that where we're growing. We're using different materials and year by year by year we're doing something a little bit better and, um, you know, growth from the community 10 15 20 years ago 30 years ago i've only really been doing this for you know 20 something years not into 30s yet but mm-hmm. um you know there uh it's changed so much it used to be 10 15 gallons 40 gallons for a three or four foot lizard yeah. you know and uh four by twos and you know maybe a couple people here and there would really deck stuff out and have gorgeous enclosures but most people were really just keeping them uh whatever the pet store would kind of just sell them or what they're what they're able to just buy right and right. Uh, that's typically standard enclosures that fit through your door fit in a living room nothing too huge and but we want to get into uh, a whole bunch of things you know of builds and all the stuff like that so we're going to try to cover as much as we can just because um, that's what we're also about as well developing new skills new ways to keep um, and like i said before sometimes when you're just buying from a pet store um you're stuck with a four by two or a cage that doesn't have a big lip at the bottom Mm -hmm. um or the lamp placements are all off and you got to readjust the lamps you know you're at the mercy of what they make and what they sell you and so you're kind of just stuck with that some people you know they may not know better and so um, they're just going to go with that and you know it's 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 perfectly fine because we're all learning and growing so i myself used to keep them in tanks and you know uh two by twos those two by two glass tanks with a uh, with a mesh top, um, you know, I used to think that was a big enclosure, right? <laughs> or uh, or like a cage that was like three by eighteen by eighteen. I used to think that was a fairly decent enclosure, until I really started working with the bigger stuff. And uh, you know, I, as I 
grow with my species or I get bigger stuff or the animal growth itself, um, I as well um, ho try to grow with it in what I'm able to provide them. And, and really, um, it's, it, all this is like developing skills in, um, in, in the smallest sense or, you know, however you want to say it, but really, uh, you know, it's allowing me to, to gain a bunch of, uh, practices and skills that I never really thought I'd, uh, I'd have. And so, um, now as far as, uh, me having started with the basic enclosures and, and, uh, growing with, uh, with whatever I'm doing, um, I then evolved into, you know, buying those enclosures and then having to, you know, drill things into the wall or, um, mm -hmm. learn how to readjust stuff. Um, you know, a lot of the new, new beginners are going to put them in like a little four by two or 18 by 18, or I mean, as, as, as big of a cage you can have. Some people are still using 75 gallons and 60 gallon enclosures and modifying the lid. And, um, I think there's quite a few ways that you can sort of make that work for a little bit. Don't get me wrong. Um, you just got to really adjust with it just because like, you know, we'll talk about like glass enclosures and and wooden enclosures and acrylic right. PVC type enclosures and really uh, all the, the pros and cons between them all, you know, like for example, like glass, um, I was just kind of getting into that where already a large, huge enclosure. So you picture something like six by two by two with glass. That's a large enclosure. Mm -hmm. and so can't really log that around too easy. Um, it's going to be stationary and then you're going to have to have a lot of help to move something like that, you know, and the draft on that alone, um, glass itself doesn't really conserve heat and all that stuff too well. And so let's say if it's near a window or something like that, it, it'll catch a draft or it's a cold room, that glass will catch the draft and then um, draw onto the cage or suck the heat out of the cage. And a lot of times they're not built for reptiles or for monitors because they're so narrow and small. They might be good for little guys um, for a little right. bit, you know, a few months, but they're really not equipped for a big monitor because there's, you know, just poor access. There's only top opening access, which monitors don't really like. Um, yeah. And so um, where people are now getting into more available cages and wooden enclosures and, and um, acrylic stuff or, or uh, PVC enclosures, you know, that's where, um, that's where we're at all, all I guess me and Alan are at now and a lot of people are, are kind of, you know, that's where your base is now. That's because where, that's where the hobby's grown. You yeah. know, you don't really keep or we don't encourage people to use glass enclosures that much anymore. Or if at all, you know, you want to try to have your enclosures built, but uh, with the current issues with wood nowadays, uh, an enclosure that used to cost $300 now costs roughly $3,000, which is very yeah, sad. Insane. And, uh, yeah, it's insane. And, and it just happened within just the last few months. Um, I'm pretty sure if you can go to any uh, any home, home improvement store, you'd be able to see that the wood is now just inflated like crazy and mm -hmm. um, essentially makes a uh, building tough. And so, you know, there's your uh, PVC option now, which has been um, a competition between a lot of people that want to make PVC enclosures. And so the price is very competitive now where you can probably find a really good deal and, right. um, you know, things like that. So, uh, we'll we'll get into the PVC enclosures in a bit, but you know, as as your growth, the growth with this is the growth as well as your monitor growing into different enclosures, but it's also you learning and your practices and what you're trying to do to provide for your animals. Those skills are enhanced, and what I mean by that is like as some as to simple simplify it, you're basically going to be a little electrician. You're going to be a little mm -hmm. plumber. You're going to be a little carpenter. Um, you're probably going to be a bathroom installment guy cause you're going to learn how to pack and stuff. Um, and you know, all of this, I, I, I never, I didn't go to, you know, or sorry, I didn't go to like a trade school and learn all that stuff. I learned all that just by going to home Depot and yep. you know, you're no longer at the mercy of these pet stores. Um, when you're building, I hope you're thinking outside of the box and kind of, uh, sort of just using tools and, and really getting down workshop style and, getting imaginative with with what you want to build um yep. yeah and so the ground up type deal you know once we're leaving the whole being you know buying from a pet store now we're talking about like actual builds right and um you know it all starts from the foundation 
you know, just like anything, anything really supportive, you want it to last long. Now, there are those enclosures that you're getting from the store that may not be caulked correctly, a uh, poor silicone that uh, monitor lizards can rip the nails out of. Now, for a little snake or a little something, it may not be too bad, but for what monitors need, dense soil, dense community, the soil is basically wet. They're thrashing water around, fecal matter, all that stuff. The heat and humidity alone will warp and tear down wood that's not protected. So that whole protection thing, we're not even talking about like adding stuff to the walls yet, lighting yet. We're just now talking about foundation and build. And so, yep. you know, um, I myself, I'm a wood person. I like that they're thick. You, you can, you can have different, different uh, thicknesses of wood. I personally use the inch thick plywood and have built with that. But I've also made a frame and applied thinner sheets of plywood on, and they both work. But one holds much better in the winter time, and that's the thick plywood. That's one inch. And uh, for me, it stands a little better without having support frames. The one. I'm sorry, the half inch or I, I, I may, may even be three-fourths inch essentially needs a frame to it if you're going to be using a ton of soil and a bunch of – if it's going to be supporting a bunch of wood and all that stuff like that, it'll it, it'll bow if it's not supported. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having things structurally built using two-by-twos or two-by-fours or whatnot and, and uh, getting that built or using really thick plywood and having that down um, – is a uh, key to the the start of your build um you know where then you'd kind of really get into actually using a material where or a paint or some type of application that you're using you know to get into um actually a, making it waterproof um eventually you're gonna have to want your cage to last long you obviously you're spending a bunch of money on this and you know it's going to be hundreds or possibly even thousands of bucks at the end of the the whole build you know buying everything like that and um you know you obviously don't want it to just last a few months or a year by by warping or rotting in a little corner so this part may be very key and it's going to be necessary for you to figure out what's best for you there's uh many options on this you know um and I think uh, I think Alan, you yourself, you use a few things as well, right? You have uh, bin setups, but you also use enclosures. Now, I, I myself, I use dry lock, and uh, I've had people use epoxy resin for me, but I've never done it myself because the fumes are way too strong for me. And so I currently use dry lock that has kind of lower vox, or um, the, the it's basically the fumes that are that are emitted after you've painted it on. Um, you know, and I use dry lock mostly for most of my enclosures just because uh, once it's applied to wood, it, it, it does really well with protecting it. But, you know, if a monitor really scratches it at it really well, it's essentially going to give as well. Um, and I mm -hmm. think there are better applications that you can use that are essentially just liquids or something that you paint on or apply on um, and you make it really strong. And epoxy resin is one of the great ones. Uh, Another one that is uh, used a lot that has very low vox are, or sorry, is uh, Zupoxy. Um, I currently don't use any of those stuff. Uh, I, I actually am just still kind of like maybe a little bit past intermediate cage building where I'm just building and applying things to the wall. And I, I'm, a, I'm actually making things a little bit easier for myself because now my symbol builds are um, to my necessities and for what I need them for. Um, you know, for example, like from what the store can give you, they probably make a two to four inch lip. But for yourself at home, you're probably going to want a lip that's 10 inches, uh, two feet, something like that, that can support right. a ton of soil. So essentially you want a bunch of soil so it's not all in the tracks and, and you can have a bunch. Um, mm -hmm. And now, so your lip or your water, your, sorry, not water, your water dam, but your lip or from the bottom to the, the, uh, the part of the door. Um, I have mine roughly a foot and a half on most of the enclosures. Cause my soil goes about a foot deep max roughly. Um, now what about you? Uh, how For, deep are yours? I'm using nest boxes and a lot of the, uh, the, okay. Dwarf monitor thing. So it's well, still a, a foot tall, though, right? 
Well, I haven't had to, to worry about it in those as much. And on some of the, even the, uh, the older wood enclosures that I have, I use nest boxes in. It was my workaround for not having to build a substrate dam or, you know, the yeah. uh, condition of the wood. Honestly, they're, those are cages that I'm planning on updating here in the new future. Um, they work great though for now. So yeah, uh, I'm still using them, but now like in the, in the larger enclosures, the walk-in enclosures, uh, I have basically a, I want to say it's around 20 inches at the front, um, a board that I have put in front of the opening. Now I can open the door, step over the board now. And that's and just a little band-aid you got, right? That just holds the soil right, there. Right. Right. Because the rest of the the I didn't I didn't account for it right when I built the cage. I had yeah. some other ideas as far as making like a little square I could actually step into. Yeah. And these were just nice thoughts because the monitors <laughs> just kicked dirt into that space and it wasn't yeah. gonna work. They uh they educated me real quick on that. So for now, yeah, it's a band aid that I have. It, it's great how you say that. You know, um, there's I think people when they're when they're building whether they have one or they have a bunch. I think everybody wants to have a perfect enclosure built first time, but mm -hmm. you're not really going to get it that first time unless like you really intricately took a lot of time on it. And sure you went, you went and took months and months and months maybe, but really uh, you're going to build one and you're probably not going to like the way you built it because the monitor did something and ripped something off or got right. out or I don't know. It's just uh, it wasn't big enough to fit everything. And so you'll then decide, all right, this is not what I want to use anymore. Or, you know, let's say you started with Plexi and then you realize it bowed and it needed a frame and or um, it scratched it up so much that it got so cloudy, you know. Um, yeah. and you wanted to decide to do something else or are you using windows and instead of a sliding glass two double plane doors you just have one sliding glass door and then you want to change it right because mm, I, I used to use the one window and then i realized dang i can't get to that far left side the where they're gonna lay yeah. if they're gonna lay and so i have to get into the enclosure so i realized all right i'm gonna have to redo the doors and that's exactly what i did and i just redid the doors i'm able to get to the other side if i needed to um and adjust so those things right there where I want you to be confident in what you're doing, but at the same time, you know, always realize that there's room for, 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 for more and there's room for more growth and you're probably going to yeah. do better the next time around. And you're not really probably going to, you're not really going to get it the first time, you know? Um, and I don't know if there is honestly a perfect enclosure. There's just yeah. what you're willing to deal with and what you're not. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things um, that I do plan on doing, cause I, I, had already purchased prior to this, and I'm really thankful now. I put in that the the full enclosures and that loft where I'm at. You know, I paid for lumber at a much cheaper price when I did that. I also bought some uh, some birch plywood that's been sitting there. It's already cut into roughly what I need, um, but that project is coming up. I need to tackle that one. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it into three cages of a certain size or two cages of another size, but the idea with those cages is to have uh, multiple options, a whole lot of access. Um, whether I decide later to run nest boxes in them or hold cage nets, nesting, it's going to be capable of doing all those things. So a very um, adjustable cage, you know, the transformer of cages, so to speak. Yeah, man, that's, that's a great idea, man. Um, right now, what I'm deciding on doing currently is uh, building cages with partitions. So since I've been yeah. breeding a lot, um, not all the time do I, so what I'm doing is paying, playing musical cages, right? And males yeah. are getting swapped out when females are laying. And so the male will be taken out for a certain amount of time, maybe weeks, maybe months. It really just depends. Um, sometimes you can go right back right away. But, um, what I want to do is, uh, have my partition up and have a latchable, um, entrance here on, on top of the, or on the actual partition and I can mm -hmm. just have them, you know, be separated when I need to, and then open it when I when I want when I want them back together. Um, that's what I'm having yeah. done in in most of my six and eight foot enclosures. Um, that way, I can utilize some more area. Also, what I want to do is get some of the ones that are currently fighting all the time to be more used to each other. Um, yeah. That that's my current issue. Is uh, I'll introduce some. And as a breeder or as a person trying to breed them, 
I'm having uh, some horrible luck with one of my males. He's just, uh, he's wild caught as an adult brought in. And so he doesn't really like life too much. And so <laughs> he's kind of really frantic when, you know, things are in his cage or new stuff's going on. Or if I have to even grab him, sometimes when I look at him, he'll even just regurgitate or go to the bathroom. Like right oh, away. Man. Yeah. So uh -huh. um, he did that earlier today too. I'm not sure if I fed him too much, but. He got up on the basking thing and regurgitated. And what's crazy is that I gave him another piece of food and then he ate it. It's like it's weird. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, he he eats. He'll he'll tong feed. It's just uh, he's uh really difficult to get to breed. And what's weird is that he'll mate with other females that aren't his type and he'll try, but he won't with his own type. So this uh, partition in this build that I'm trying to do, um, currently I'm having done in a couple cages. Um, should help with those introductions. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, man. So uh, that's currently where I'm. I'm at with uh, with most of my with most of my builds right now. I just still using dry lock and and not really changing up too much, just because I'm comfortable with how the dry lock works and how fast it works. But um, I, I don't know. Eventually, eventually, I'm going to have to. Like I want to try the Zupoxy really, really, right. really bad. Yeah, um, I think it's got a. I don't know. It, it, you're you're able to do it indoors, and it's not gonna um, spread a bunch of fumes, and you don't have to let it air out a bunch, and you can paint it afterwards, and it kind of does look really nice. Um, it's just uh, applying it to the whole enclosure. I'm not sure. I can probably do like a platform. I just don't feel like pasting it all over the enclosure. So. Um, I use certain things like I go to Home Depot for everything, really. So, mm -hmm. you know, still talking about building from the ground up and what we're kind of doing and and our current applications. Um, you know, I have this uh this uh bathroom caulking um silicone thing that I buy, and um, you're just uh, you're just used putting it in a regular caulking gun, and that's what I'm using to put in all the corners and creases and cracks where it'll keep water from getting to the wood. Now the right. dry lock, the dry lock or whatever you're doing is only going to do so much because that's just covering the walls, but the water is going to seep into the little crevices and it'll cause rot underneath the application that you will apply it. And so having cocked it where you're now uh, reinforcing and making it more waterproof, um, that's been a plus for me on what I need to do because my animals thrash water all the time. They have water pans that they spill or I'll spill water or sometimes I'll even need to revamp all the soil. And instead of spraying it, I just get pictures of water. I just picture water in there and stir it around, mm -hmm. you know, instead of spraying it because it gives me a, a, a wrong, a wrong look because I'm only looking at the surface when I really need to look down deep down in the soil, right? A foot down. That soil over yeah, so I, have to, I have to turn it in um, the whole being protected and lined up is where I'm uh, I, I would like to get better but that's currently what I'm using now and that's that's been my ticket where I'll use dry lock extreme and um, I'll just have it painted all over maybe about five or six coats um, and sometimes if uh, like an animal is always really scratching at stuff I'll kind of do maybe almost 10 coats yeah and, um, but still um, some monitors are so crazy that they'll they'll get past that. Their nails will just dig right into the dry lock and just peel it. Um, right. And so uh, I guess some other some other usages are uh, FRP, which is yep. fiber reinforced plastic. I I actually failed miserably with that ten <laughs> years ago, right? And so this was the the thing that people were recommending. That's that was the only thing that people were really recommending back in the days because right. um, zoopoxy wasn't really out like that and or it was more for just people that were doing zoo stuff. And so right. it wasn't really being done by the typical hobbyist and typical keeper. And then um, so, you know, that FRP is sold in eight by four sheets at a Home Depot as well. And it's that stuff where you walk into a public bathroom and it's the textured white walls. Yep. <laughs> It's ones kind of, you can uh it's kind of bumpy yeah and um that's it that's it where now my my problem with that was i couldn't cut it well enough with the tools that i had and so i had to use like shears and cut it to thing and the edges would be all choppy and 
<clears throat> I eventually applied it to the wood, but um, the way it looked and and all that stuff like that, there was just so many gaps, and so I kind of just I kind of scrapped that project. Really, I, yeah. I didn't put any monitor lizard in it. It sat in it sat in the garage for like a week or so, and um, this was one of my first builds too, where I was like, all right, I'm gonna try to cut this wood. I got you know saws and stuff, and got materials and. Dude, I barely had anything. I really just had FRP and wood, and I really thought I was doing what I was what I needed to do. And really, um, you know, a lot of you guys are gonna have to draw and mm -hmm. s make a list of materials to buy. Probably ask people and what to do and do things in stages. Yep. And if I you have to... a friend or like a a neighbor, um, a parent, somebody, somebody that you know that has some carpentry skills. Yeah. Go get educated. You go, know? Go, get it, it, it'll take you really a long, long way. Now, um, I like I said, I, I basically thought I can build a cage within just a day. Yeah. And realistically, you're not. It's things have to dry and all that stuff, right? That's that's just that's besides the point. But you what you what I what I was mentioning with doing things kind of bit by bit is let's say you're doing the structural part first and you're just you know popping two by twos together or two by fours together and getting just your frame out. Um, and then, you know, if you're doing that, or if you're doing really thick plywood, you're just going to cut it to size, what you need, all set all pieces that you need, and then basically button it together, screw it together. Right. Mm -hmm. That part is, that part is simple. Right. But then once you start applying stuff to the walls, then you start using different applications like uh, silicones or, or glues or paints and stuff like that. Those things need to dry. So this part will just be your box. You know, it's mm -hmm. just going to be the skeleton of stuff and um, where you're now intricately thinking about, okay, what's going to protect my stuff. And then, you know, now we're getting into more, more detailed things where um, I myself just build wood, but you can use and paint the outside of it, or you can add a uh, trim and all that stuff if you want to. But uh, for me, and to kind of be drawing two sides here, I have more functional cages rather than like gorgeous decked out um, furniture centerpiece type stuff. I don't really have a bunch of those. Mine are just boxes, you know. And um, and so um, I, I don't I don't really I can't really get into the I'd say those huge, huge enclosures and all that stuff like that. I'm really just doing now from my, my normal caulking and silicone and, and just, just that part, you know? Yeah. Um, sometimes those big enclosures, I'll be honest, sometimes they're easier. <laughs> but what happens? I find anyway, I find that sometimes when you got to build like a, a four by eight to some, you go grab a sheet of plywood yeah. and you, you throw it up together. Um, once you you've done it. It. yeah yeah minimal cuts it's real nice you're like oh i'm just gonna make this size and uh sometimes they can be easier the, the when yeah, you need these is, unique shapes sometimes oh man yeah this yeah. is that hardest part now okay you have we're at still at the ground we're still the foundation buttoning stuff up right now the door the door is <laughs> the hardest part the door i mean when you get to it okay you have many options you can do the track that they sell now yeah. home depot and Lowe's sells the plastic track that plastic track will break with pressure and much usage okay yeah they sell aluminum tracks on amazon the aluminum tracks are much more durable and will have a much longer shelf life basically the ends won't crack um and applying them is the same way they have a little entry hole you just you just drill it through and that's just it now um, some people might find that hard finding all that stuff and then going to buy the glass. Okay. That's a few different stages. You mm -hmm. simply are going to different things. Home Depot will not have glass for you. They have plexiglass, but they don't have big sheets of glass and just a glass cutter there for you. No, you'll have to actually go to a company that sells glass, have the things cut out. Now, um, you want glass that's tempered. You don't want to, to just shatter and have a bunch of shards. You probably want it to break in little pieces, you know. Um, that'll be better glass to use. And I use fairly thicker glass rather than the thin, thin glass. That's just because uh, I'm scared that the thin pieces will just break as I slide them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so now there's many other ways to make doors. 
um, people like uh, we mentioned earlier, you can just pop in a window, the, an mm -hmm. actual window that you buy also at Home Depot, okay, or Lowe's, and it's in the window section, and you're just getting a four by four or however size you want that they have available, and you're just literally pop putting a frame around it and popping it into your cage and securing it. Um, that is your door, and those the pro about those is that they they're sealed, they lock. Yeah. Um, they are also very good at keeping in heat and humidity. Right. Um, me having sliding glass doors, I actually have no vents in my enclosures at all, but the sliding glass for me has a little slit in between, and that allows heat and humidity to have some type of escape for me. Um, for me, I actually have find that as a plus rather than having some of the enclosures that just trap so much stagnant mm -hmm. heat. And I but something. didn't you have to you yeah. had to learn how to use it for yourself too right? yeah yeah i had to learn basically what what was better for my setup and and really um you know we mentioned this earlier as we were talking but you you really have to kind of get into the thick of things having animals you know i i can explain all this to you and you can kind of you know, get a feel of it and write it down, maybe even have like mental thoughts about it and all that stuff like that or try to play it out. Right. But until you're actually there with it and the animal, it's kind of, it, it'll rip your cage apart if you're not doing it right or something like that, you know, or, or it'll hurt itself. Um, it'll get into things. And, and so, um, man, uh, really, really reading, reading your animal and, I guess what type of enclosure for it, you know? Yep. Yep. There's a um, man. Well, we should stick to one part, try to stick to a certain uh, theme in this, but as you're talking, my brain's firing off and all these different yeah, same. things I've tried. <laughs> so many directions. And so, you know, um, now where we're at with the whole window thing, um, there's the last option would be like building doors. Wouldn't, mm -hmm. And those are just sliding out or not sliding out doors, but doors that you latch and open out. I actually have a couple of those and I find a couple of some of those to be pretty efficient as well. But I'm right. um, getting in and out quickly, not all the time though, okay? Um, and so, you know, there's a few ways to make your doors. Now, you just have to cut that and you have to figure out how you're going to frame the glass and mm -hmm. one. And so if, if you can have somebody like like Alan said with carpentry skills that can do that stuff for you, um, that'd be great. But again, that door part, that's, that's, that's where these, it'll, it'll fit in for what you're either willing to do, what you have at hand and what you're, what, who, who can help you, mm -hmm. you know, just your capabilities essentially, you know, and, on all aspects of what you're, what, what you're able to, to come up with. And so, um, I don't know, utilizing it and, and having it where, um, Man, your I don't know, your 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 next thing after the doors is gonna be like heat as well. And that's another thing that you probably don't wanna just do on your own. You wanna learn some of that as well. Picking that up from another electrician or you know, learning on YouTube, that's kinda how I learned as well, but I also learned from a couple electricians as well on what to yeah. do um, safely. Uh, now after the window, right, it's basically your, your thing is, well, we were talking earlier about um, our soil depth, right? That kind of gives you an idea on space and stuff you have to work with, with availability for your animal, availability for logs, availability for lamps and bulbs. And so mm -hmm. all that take up space and um, you want to be able to still provide enough room. So two foot enclosures don't really do it. 18 foot, 18 inches enclosures that are that tall. Don't really do it. Uh, if you're looking to apply a ton of soil and have a bunch of ample room and then also have room for your, your lizard, just the bass with enough space between the bulb and then the bulb at, as well as the fixture. So all that has is added up and you're, you're trying to really then do the math now with just space alone. And so people are kind of giving you an eyeball of like four foot is a good size enclosure that's tall, three to four foot, maybe even taller than that. So that way you have much more space to work with. Yeah. Um, but if you're working with really tall enclosures, then you got more, you do have more space to work with. And, but you now just have to accommodate for more as well. Okay. 
those walls got to be really strong for being a sturdy enclosure for being such yeah. a tall enclosure and all that stuff like that. Yeah. You know, just to touch on something um, real quick, back to the doors, um, really put a lot of thought into your doors. Um, yeah. What you want to happen. Okay. Uh, I will say this, unfortunately, mm. I, I forgot have... the latch door is another one. <laughs> and that's the one I just yeah. started applying. I just started using latch doors. So, um, with some of the smaller monitors, unfortunately, with your basically standard open and close type of doors, um, ooh, we had a we had a small hold back get some toes crunched. Um, I hate saying that, but it is the truth. And if I'm in there, you know, it, it wouldn't really matter. And if an animal decides to jump out of the cage, I'm, I'm going to go hands on and catch that animal. But to other people uh, in your household, you might have them do something or whatnot. They might actually be afraid of your animal. And that's what happened in my case is um, I had someone else doing something in a, in a closure. And one of these Ackies decides to jump out at feeding time. And uh, out of reaction, the person goes to close the door. It got a little hand caught in there, and yeah. you know, we lost some toes. Oh. So, yeah, it, it sucks, but that's much um, less likely to happen with a sliding glass door. All right? Um, for me, I, for me myself, I don't see it as, as too much of an issue, but just certain things to think about. Um, and yeah. I, I hate telling that story. It, it didn't happen too long ago either, but you know, it's a reality yeah, of things. Stuff happens. And yeah, for me, uh, losing uh, Kimberly rock monitors is uh, oh, not a chance that I want to take. Um, I've actually lost one before jumping out of an Exoterra enclosure and mm -hmm. I couldn't get the door closed fast enough. And it was literally split of a second, split of a split of a split of a second, really. And it, it just wedged through. Um, and I literally went around the whole house, thrashed everything, looking for this lizard. And I thought it was in a refrigerator. I thought it was. So I tore apart <laughs> the refrigerator, right? Like they took apart the door, flipped it upside down, took everything, the motor, the back part, I just gutted it, right? And it wasn't even in there. It was just in the, <laughs> it was in the, it was in the bathroom underneath the, the sink. Oh, and, man. and yeah, I was, um, I was going nuts. So, um, you know, to, to where I'm at now, even though I had adults, I didn't really have to worry about that. So once they're adults, you don't really have to worry about sliding through the glass, but when they're really tiny, they're flat, mm -hmm. and their noses are flat and, um, they can get through, I would say, maybe three millimeters of space. Yeah. Um, literally that's all they really need. And, um, I have now have latch doors on all of the baby Kimberly enclosures because, um, I don't want them getting out. So there's actually no real door. Like the front is just a glass piece and it's, it's stable there. It's stuck there. Yeah. Um, and the top has a small entry hole. That's like four by four. And that's just a, uh, enough for my hand and a cup to get into and nothing else and then there's no major exit or running out point for those kimberleys it's just i don't want them dashing off i don't want something that a customer paid for running out of the door and me having been to there <laughs> lost i lost your lizard because i'm slow yep. so, but, um, you know it's just thinking smarter than the lizard and this is where um, like I said before, I, I wanted to just keep them in. I wanted to keep them in Exoterra's 18 by 18s that I can stack on a shelf, right? But mm -hmm. then I was like, oh, that's not going to work. Uh, it's not going to work because I can see it happening. I'm going to be up at 2 in the morning feeding on not on my game, and it's just going to dart off, and I'll just, you know, lose a lizard. Yep. But so, you know, those things are the lizard teaching me. Um, you know, we kind of mentioned it, and I don't want to sound like some smart alley guru or some – you know, um, some, I don't know, person that's like all high and mighty and saying, Hey, listen to your lizard and stuff. But you're, what, what you're really trying to do is having them and seeing what they're showing you and, and, uh, kind of getting from that. So if they're getting out through those cracks, basically you have to step it up, change how yeah. your setup's going to be. Or, or if you're worried about that front opening is just too much, you'll have to figure out then how to change from that. Um, same thing with just like, all right, if I had, uh, 
if I had my lamps a certain way, or if I if I put a cage around the thing and my lizard uh, climbed on that and um, it's a cage around the bull, right? And my lizard got on that and burned it. I basically basically be figure out then now, all right, how am I going to build enclosures later on with bulbs this way, where mm -hmm. my lizard isn't going to do this, um, right? Or like let's say your water thing, your water feature. Um, if it's placed a certain place and it's always tipped over or something like that, or what they are is they're trying to get under there, right? Um, I no longer put my water bowls on the floor. I put them on top of something so they're not going to tip it over. Or mm -hmm. what it is is there's a little tiny shelf that the water thing gets to sit on and the animals go under that. Um, and, you know, just, just ide ideas like that where um, – these you're trying to read your animals try to do something and you want to complement it by changing the enclosure somehow and you're going to redo that in the next build or change around your current build that you're doing you know one thing i think uh just real quick on the exoterra so that i can save people some heartbreak uh from my own experiences uh, i still use some of those exoterras but they are not for brand new babies um, yeah same they're for adults right right i have lost some some babies um they can actually escape out of those exos in different ways um also the way the doors open on the side the there's a gap when you open the door um towards the corners yep. and it's a great little escape thing for animals because you're thinking that you have the door open it's going to come that mm -hmm. way and the last thing you're going to do is try to close the door real quick because the only result then is pinching the animal. You're not going to do that, yeah. um, you know, and they hit the ground running. So uh, save yourself some heartache. Uh, if you're getting a little bit of an older animal and that's what you have to use right now and you've done some some research on how to make that work, <clears throat> great. But, yeah, for brand new babies, I would just skip it. All right. So getting into that now to make it work, make an, making an exoterra work for your monitor, right? Oh. Now, some people, some people don't, you know, it's not, man, I, I don't want to shame anything because we all kind of started from somewhere. So, um, all right, what I do with an exoterra, it's, it's, it's the same. And all I'm doing is now solid, solidifying the roof of the enclosure by using either a piece of plywood or a piece of PVC. Now you can kind of ghetto rig it if you want to use like aluminum tape over the current mesh that it's on and sit the lamps on top of that. That's allowing less heat and humidity escape, but it's still not trapping it in there well enough. Okay. Right. So what I do is I just um, take off the, the original screen, put in a piece of plywood and then hook a heat lamp on the inside and just run it like it's a normal wooden enclosure. Mm -hmm. um, and that way the exoterra um, is useful. It actually conserves a little bit more humidity and I'm not throwing away an enclosure, you know? So right. um, with the amount of space that fits in between, uh, hi, hi, my love. Um, the amount of space that fits in between the the enclosure and the actual stoppers that are holding the thing in place yeah. is only about half an inch or less than that so you have to get very cold. very yeah very thin plywood to fit right into that groove right. and then you can move the stoppers over holding it in place and um yeah that's how you kind of rig it rig it a exoterra okay yep. um and this is just uh those enclosures that are you're still you know we're, we're still trying to make things work we don't want to be wasteful and just throw things away and and you know obviously there's like like he said he's having all of these enclosures still be utilized but he's trying to grow and get new enclosures where it's going to be replacing all those and right eventually the glass ones will be taken out yep so, and another thing for me is you know those those enclosures are great for what they are um they they might suit you for certain animals um, in certain events, uh, times in their lives. Or uh, let's say if I was keeping some, you know, the Australian guys, they have access to some of these really small monitors. Um, some of those enclosures would do great. Even I would say like. Right. The, like the Gil and I. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, even, they're, they're smaller than Aki's. And right. um, the, a three foot enclosure is, <laughs> is going to suit them really well. Right. Yeah. Um, but. 
you know, going forward for me, when I'm looking at new enclosures and phasing things out, I'm actually, hmm, how do I, I'm, I'm actually building enclosures to grow with what I have going on and to be adaptable. So just because this year I may have done dwarf monitors in this enclosure, um, I may have to adjust things and use that as a raise up cage the following season for um, sand monitors or something else that's in that mid size animal range. Interchangeable, um, yeah. Right. That, and that's why I don't do any of the full rock stuff. Right. Or any of the stuff that's going to be stuck to the wall for good. Um, yep. Yeah. I agree. You know, and that's, that's just us. If, and don't let us confuse you. If you're keeping a, a handful of animals, maybe just one animal, go yeah. ahead and, and build you want it to out. really check it out. Right. right. Just get your measurements right. You know, figure out your basking spot. Here's the thing is like, if you tell a guy, I want my, um, my basking spot to be 12 inches from the actual bowl. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to basically make your full rock thing or you're going to buy a full rock thing or whatever. It, it can it can be anything, but it's going to be stuck there. OK, once after you've applied it, silicone it in place and all that, it's going to be stuck there. So if you have a distance between the bulb and the actual basking spot and it's roughly one foot. Now, let's say you start using a bulb, right? And all of a sudden it's way too hot. The basking spot's like 160. Yeah. You don't even need that there's no way for you to raise that thing up and down. And you may have to then choose a different bulb to use or then you're at a dilemma there, you know, where, mm -hmm. all right, am I going to have to um, put a different basking spot or I can't deduct this. I can, let's say if it was 12 inches away and the basking spot was only 100, 115, you can adjust by applying something on top of that, which is very simple, but to deduct and move it down, is hard and to move a bulb upwards when it's already on the ceiling is hard so yeah, right. that's where my dilemma is when coming to doing situations like that so if you already have it planned out got the bulb you want to use use your surface temperature gun to measure the exact temperatures that this distance will be even on a regular platform when it's a skeleton and not done completely yet right you get an idea of what what it'll be and so for me most of my bulbs and the basking area at 10 inches to a foot is 124, 125. And I kind of know that as a given. So I'll make my things like that. But, you know, if your animal all of a sudden also grows, outgrows that, and then it's all of a sudden really closer to the bulb, you have to then adjust again. So I yes. like my enclosures easily adjustable by everything being interchangeable. I can unscrew it screw it back in with something else um if i need to like these shelves that i have if i want to move them an inch an inch lower unscrew it move them an inch lower screw it back in you know mm -hmm. it's not it's not it's not an issue um so yeah but our all like i like yeah we don't want to discourage you guys if you guys are able to do it correctly we encourage you guys to definitely work out a, a bomb decked out enclosure you know we want right. that all right. That, well, you know, we started off talking exos real quick. I guess let me. Um, I mean, it's just, I guess, like the whole beginner part. If they want to, you know, it's all about really just all of our growth and we'll, you know, what we're able to do with these little things, you know. Right. Right. For those of you guys that are out there using that stuff, um, don't be afraid to take some, even if it's that uh, styrofoam boards that you can pick up pretty cheap. Um, you can tape those around the sides of the enclosure. You can tape those to the bottom of the enclosure, especially during the winter where you might live. Um, yeah. These are because, just really blankets, you know, blank band-aids that yep. they're hooping out, you know? Yep. And it doesn't look pretty, okay? <laughs> yeah. That's why uh, Kai yeah, just, explained. Just functional. Right. You're just looking at function at that point and making something use, uh, making use of something that you have. All right. Um, cause Kai mentioned glass, uh, glass does not, if your room's cold, if your room's 65 degrees, the edge of that glass is going to be 65 degrees. And what I see a lot of times people doing in that situation is then the overall temperature in the cage drops. So they add more of a, uh, a um, a larger wattage bulb. You now, unfortunately, all you've done is the edge is usually still 65 degrees. You might've right, um, raised the temperature up a bit. 
but you're actually just cooking the animal inside. There's nowhere for it to escape. There's no gradient in there. Um, you have to take these things into account. And, you know, sometimes that's why I think a lot of people steer away from them. And right. uh, for good reason, you know, if you don't if you don't know what you're you're messing around with, you don't don't know what you're doing. You could uh, make a, a we joke. You've heard it probably before a jerky machine. Yeah. Uh, if, where you're just dehydrating an animal. Yeah. You're and, basically pumping heat into it and then allowing it to just evaporate out without a problem. Right. You know? Yeah. So um, having that conserved heat and you'll hear a lot of people say, you know, cover the top with something or, you know, it's just ways you can rig it. And. Those are all good for a little certain amount of time. Like I mentioned, they're band-aids. So yeah. you know, you're going to have to um, figure out something that's much more sturdy along the lines, something where it'll be more solid, uh, could last a lot longer. Essentially, the shelf life is going to be years and years and years, hopefully. Right. right. Yeah. So then I guess – the most experience maybe uh, you've had so far is, is building your own wood enclosures, right? Specifically working with wood. Right. Yeah. Just wood enclosures. Um, that's now, you know, getting into what I'm being, what I'm trying to learn about is the whole Zupoxy thing. Um, yeah. I haven't, I haven't really get it, got it yet. I've just been watching YouTubes and um, I think a, a, a later build, I kind of wanted to do something a little nice. Like, again, the, I always change my mind because I'm like, you know, I'm going to put it up, but I only can use it for one one animal and one thing and one size. And so can't, it's yeah. not going to be easily interchangeable. So, yeah, I, I was thinking about just making some mushrooms, you know, and making, <laughs> you know, making the ones that come out from the wood where it's like a, it's like a whole shelf. Right? Yeah. And you can just uh, shape it and then paint it and then apply it to the wall. Uh, that's that's all I really wanted to do. I didn't really want to do anything else. Um, <laughs> now, now where where the whole cage thing has taken me, right? I I now understand things and that I never thought I'd be doing. You know, like, like I mentioned before, the whole plumbing and electrical work oh, and fossil uh, cheese stuff, and you you then become really skilled at at all, at all this after you know many many builds, but. Um, you always there, there's always the community to kind of go back to and you can always ask different people what they used and some people will tell you they use this and some people will tell you they use that and you all you might ask a few people and then figure out what's best for you um not I, to keep lizards that require water basically in that yeah. degree that's what's best for me <laughs> yeah yeah i can't have too much water for for me my flow of things now um I, I wish I can have plumbing hooked up on all my enclosures, basically turn a knob, have it all go down one pipe out, out through the, and out into the yard, into the street. Right. That's really, that's like nice. I, that's just easy work, you know, and then I just have to fill the things back up and, and that's it. But I still do everything uh, with love, right. Manually and all that stuff. I carry out all my, all my, um, uh, my bins and stuff like that to the to the side and just dump it into the yard you know and Oof. yeah so uh that's that's kind of how i think many people do things i don't I, I don't know some people flush stuff some pour down a certain thing but uh to be honest i just kind of uh it's just going into the bunch of mulch and stuff yeah do you have a stretching program you you follow prior to uh getting in that cage bending over and lifting up you know that 20 30 pounds of water in that <laughs> shoe i actually uh instead of uh, having anything hooked up right i'm pouring my bin into a big bucket so then i can carry that out easy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then all that. of those all of those go out to be washed and sanitized and hooked up so you know i wish i can do a actual thing where it, like i said it's all plumbed up and stuff but um i, I haven't gotten to that and where my how my stuff flows i just don't have the room and the hose to do all that you know what i mean right. it just doesn't make sense you know um but if you had that option like let's say all your stuff was in the garage and you had it all plumbed up and then you just had to to hook up the little hose and the pump and have it sucked out into the street into the drain you know like direct that's clean and ideal <laughs> but, yeah you know, not everybody gets that option 
or has that ability or it's not that comfortable because they live upstairs in a in in a in a in a big studio or something like that and you right. know downstairs is so far away and so i don't know you know just just the just some ideas on why some people do or capable of some stuff and not of others yeah my recommendation my recommendation for that is um no water monitors no mertens mike stefani out there bless your heart man because uh yeah. you've got a commitment to those animals i just i love them yeah. they're so awesome looking but i just that that's the one thing that keeps me from them i don't want to get into plumbing i'm not ready for that that education yet yeah so. now um for for the person that um is doing a large enclosure but you only got like one animal right Mm-hmm. Okay. Now I, I kind of mentioned this before, where you should think about the soil level and up as well, right? For your basking and um, your heat and humidity and your placements of stuff. But the soil and down, we're still there. I'm not even. We haven't even left there yet, and we're already an hour into there. So <laughs> you know, we're hooking your cage up, and you got your lamps and all that stuff like that in there, right? And um, and let's say you figured out the distance and you made your cage the way you wanted it. Um, now, many people will recommend you to use a bunch of soil. And I, I've recommended it probably to you as well. But you have to use it a certain way. And mm-hmm. it's not just dumping a bunch of soil into there and calling it a day. Now, if you lived in Florida or Texas during hot times or where I live sometimes where it's really warm and uh, humidity is great and heat is probably really good and stuff like that. It's, it's really dense, right? Um, that, that'll help you out a little bit, but where let's say you live somewhere colder and, um, your amount of soil will need to be heated. A, a lot of people will recommend beginners to do that, you know, Oh, put it in a huge enclosure, a bunch of soil, this and that. It's, it's, it's been done before. You can definitely do it. Now, the only problem is that don't recommend that if that person isn't really there as far as their level of experience. Right. You know, hooking a eight by four up and stuff like that. I just want to let you know, even a person like me and Alan have slight issues hooking an eight by four up. Yep. You know, it's not as simple as you think just to heat that amount of soil and stuff like that now i I don't want you to just forget that that's what your goal is because you do want to get to those levels and things like that but you know you want to start small and to be honest your main goal is just a lizard your main goal is not to have Mm -hmm. bioactivity and and all that stuff like that yet oh yeah okay but We'll get Should there. We even we'll get go, there. oh man. Yeah, we're going to get there because <laughs> that's, all, that's all important with uh, the eventual, eventual what you want to end up with, you know? And so. Do you want to um, keep monitors or do you want to keep bugs? Come on, yeah. people. That's so, a... <laughs> you know, you're going to get into those things later on, but right now we're really just focused on the lizard. Mm-hmm. And, you know, having a bunch of soil again is great. So, what I recommend people do, and I've come up with a, an idea, but. It's taken from other people's ideas that I just I just kind of try to simplify it for me. And I have a little PVC sleeve that you can apply to the wall, and there's a heat pad in there, and the cord runs out of the cage. Of course, that's on a thermostat, or use a heat pad that's generating just enough heat. Um, and what that's going to do is make your soil warm. And as mm-hmm. your soil is moist and warm, it, that generates the dense humidity that rises into your enclosure. OK, um, rather than you having to spray it down all the time, things like that, kind of we get we get into, you know, where you have to do a lot of maintenance because, you know, there's not a lot of support or when you put a lot of support there, you don't have to do a whole bunch at all. Mm-hmm. And when you have a ton of soil and it's heated properly to like a good, you know, mid 80s, something like that, and not all of it, only a fraction of it is needs to be heated because then you, if your cage overheated, you still needed the cool spot that was 70 or if your animal wanted to be at 70 it has another option of the enclosure to be at 70 and that's below away from the heated soil area okay um now for the guys that have little niles or little water monitors or any of those baby monitors at all any of them you know 
Um, most of us are going to recommend you to keep it simple. You know, you don't have to have a ton of bedding. But if you were to get to that point and or if you want to just do it yourself, you're just like, hey, I just I love my animal. I only want one. I kind of want it to live a great uh, extravagant life and though there are those people and i don't want to stop those people from doing what they want to do treating their animal like it's precious because we love what that what you guys do and so you know you just want to do it the right way have all your calculations all, all your ducks lined up essentially from the ground up and understanding heating your soil is a big thing in the monitor world where mm -hmm. it controls everything it, it not just does the humidity part and allows your animal to escape and stuff like that and, um, you know, revamps them when they need to shed and they're going down and getting humid just in those burrows. But your females, their reproductive, everything, just the whole the push for, for all I need to do sometimes is add a nest bin into a female's enclosure and that sets her into everything. Yeah. So um, as soon as she knows, oh, I have a nest bin, I, I you know, this is the support I kind of need. I'm not sure if this is what she's saying, but, you know, that's kind of what I'm gathering from when I give them nest bins, they utilize it. And so um, any nesting option essentially will be beneficial to your female. And this is where your heating and all that stuff like that is important. We're still at ground level, okay? We're still at your foot of soil if you want to use it. Now, if you're utilizing... A fairly good size enclosure and you built one a couple of enclosures like alan has and even myself i still have one or two that are shallow enclosures that i essentially am not able to put a foot of soil in i have deep nest bins and um that's just how i, I do things on on that aspect so although there are levels where there's beginners and intermediate and like really top-notch enclosures feel free to utilize and go back and be versatile mm -hmm. you know um don't just oh man I, i'm like a like only noobs do that or only you know beginners man i, I have a couple monitors that are raising glass tanks right now just because i know how to rig it right you know yeah so yeah and i you know babies i'm sure you utilize uh glass enclosures sometimes just for brand new babies yeah, uh, I, I have. I, I raise them in it, um, and I I just have them rigged because the tops are they have a heat lamp that's dropped in them, so right. the it's not just the a crummy Exoterra. It's 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 modified a little bit. So. Right, and I use the same thing in certain situations because um, honestly, they're they're easy for me. I can see what's going on. I can monitor the babies very closely, yeah. um, and for. A little while, I, I utilize uh, sometimes just paper towels uh, in these setups, and it's very, very sparse, very uh, industrial, I guess, in that sense. Because the whole idea about that setup is make sure the baby's doing healthy. I'll once yeah. it's locked on, eating, doing the things it should be, and there's no problems that I can notice. Right. Hey, then I'll get him into something different. Right. For the time being, you know, this works. Yeah. And, and uh, and that's where, like, um, when you're looking at, like, toenail tips, tail tips, mm -hmm. things like that when they're shedding, right? For small monitors, because they're so thin, or some species of monitors, their tail tips are very, very thin, right? They can snap off if it's dried or got – if they were to whip it, it, um, it can t split or something like that. Um, and keeping the integrity of those – toenail tips and tail tips is very important so sure we're having you see examples of what we keep babies like pretty simple right just bare almost where we're kind of just having to see them do really well first before we even start adding stuff but once you get into right. like a couple months into the stuff and they're you know um obviously you're they're going to start shedding and you'll right. see that just the paper towel is not enough you know, and you'll have to just spraying is obviously not enough. And then the whole you spraying poop on paper towel that I think we can all smell that right now. Paper right. towel, <laughs> poop and you spraying it. That smell. We all smell that right now. Right. Yeah. We're, that's a smell we're all familiar with. And that is actually a bacterial infection waiting to happen. If mm -hmm. you like that, you know, Yep. Um, and so changing paper towels out 
will have to be something you do much more often. It's not something that you can just leave poopy and and um, yeah, that's not what you want to do. It's entirely you know purpose based for that. Most most of the time, for a lot of people, you're not going to get a monitor that young. Even if you're getting a tiny little guy, they're usually got a month on them um, yeah. for the most part. And they can so, be on bedding and all that stuff like that. Yeah, right. All right, we still, uh, I think we're still, yeah, you know, something that I've had kind of an idea about uh, lately, I've, I've used similar ideas, um, so to speak, with nest bins, but I know you use that PVC sleeve with a heating element in it to heat the dirt that's in placed yeah. on one side of the dirt. But also for these larger enclosures, if um, maybe you want to keep uh, one animal or just one type of animal, um, not a bunch of different types of animals, but you want to build them one really nice big enclosure. Um, one way to maybe think and about heating your soil uh, down below is actually to, from the stages of, of planning out your build, leave a space under your um, enclosure, which I recommend anyway, like a subfloor, um, just because if you're, you never want your, bottom of the cage in contact with the direct ground okay uh because the temperatures are going to fluctuate down there a lot especially towards the cold side um you're going to have some issues so especially on something like uh if you have a concrete base in your house you're you're on a concrete slab um if you're on a a wood subfloor maybe um it's a little bit better but i would definitely recommend whatever cage you go with get it off the ground all right it's going to be a lot more stable but now in those those enclosures, um, you can actually use that space or you can plan out a build that uses that space underneath to put heating pads um, in a somewhat semi closed off area where there's not a ton of ventilation going across because you don't want to waste your heat, but traps that air enough with with some air exchange to give you a 10 degree boost under that cage. You yeah, know? or even that, touching, just touching. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. going to boost your your temperatures. It's going to keep your soil temperatures a lot more stable. Um, and especially if you use that, maybe you can use that on a thermostat and control, you know, by by monitoring and getting familiar with it, you can control your soil temperature throughout the year to a certain extent. So just different different things to think about. And I mean, that's heat pads. Um, I've seen people do it with um, on some of these large cages. Um, they I don't even know what you'd call it. It's basically like a heated water system, you know, underneath. Yeah. And so that's cool. Piping, it's a yeah. hot water that's ran through pipes that go underneath your enclosure. That's um, way above me. So there, there's a there's a guy, dang. I actually don't even kind of I don't even remember his uh his name or his company. But uh, he's definitely not American, and he had like <laughs> he had like uh, if I can describe it, like his his whole setup was all like rocks and boulders all along the walls, right? Mm -hmm. And he had animals all over, but um, there was uh, wiring in between all of the rocks in the walls, and that brought the ambient up inside right. the entire thing so you see how intricate some of these enclosures can be where kind of thinking outside the box for inside the box yeah it's kind of it's, it's weird but yeah if i can get people to think kind of like a box within a box is even if you're doing whole cage nesting if you were to build an enclosure that's a box within a box think about just just talking about where your substrate sits you're going to have a lot more flexibility a lot more yeah. control about the temperature of that soil and making it usable for your animals, especially for nesting females. Yeah, even for nesting, because let's say you had an eight-foot enclosure and you wanted to dig the whole bottom, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people, yeah. we do it, we do it, but a lot of us have tried to hone in on creating the perfect nest box, so to speak, where the temperatures are right, the structural is good enough. There's a hole big enough just for the female to fit through. Um, it's structurally sound inside where she'll have uh, comfortable positions laying and all that stuff like that where it won't collapse on her. Um, the, mm -hmm. soil in, the soil, sand, and water consistency within the bin also has to be a certain type of right. um, 
perfectness for her. And so, uh, yeah, that's uh, all of that is is in play. Now, this is, you know, us talking about how our builds are complementary to our to our setup, like to our our setup on how we want to breed, right? Like right. I, I even have some of my enclosures stacked on top of each other where there's heat lamps underneath the specific area and right above it in the enclosure, enclosure above it are the heat bins. I mean the right. nest bins and the, sorry, the heated nest bins. And so um, as the heat radiates from the bottom enclosure, they go upwards. They're heating that one just enough as the heat penetrates through the one piece of wood and then the top cages piece of the wood and then it penetrates through the soil to the bin and all that it creates just enough gradient to make right around 80 something degrees for my bin if it's any hotter i just move the bin slightly to the side right. and that will give me more cooler gradients um so if i can give people a visual uh, maybe let's let's say you have three enclosures stacked on top of each other whatever size uh, yeah. Let's maybe say a, a six foot enclosure. Okay. So imagine that the bottom one has a heat lamp on one side of it, more towards one side of that bottom cage. All right. Um, the next cage up, put the heat lamp on the opposite the end. Side. Yeah. And, and stagger the heating elements on those cages. And then what Kai's talking about is then a, a nest bin is placed uh, also staggered and you play with those temps a little bit. I do the same thing with a temp gun, with a little monitor and you, you watch the temps and you move that nest bin side to side to provide the right temperatures and a gradient within there. Um, and I do the exact same thing and I stagger it that way. Uh, so you can move one slightly one way, slightly um, to the side so you can reach those right temperatures, but also um by heating the one above you as you go up because heat rises, you might have to, you know, if you use a adjust, yeah. right? A 40 watt bulb on the top, you might have to use a 50 on the bottom. Um, yeah. Play with your own temps and, and take those things into consideration if you're going to use a system like that. Yeah. Now, um, I guess getting back, and uh, I, I'll say this again you guys that have one or, two, one or two, what was that? Oh, I said I jumped the gun. I was going a little on a tangent there. So <laughs> no, all right. I don't think I'm about to go on a one too, but um the solo I'll say it again. The solo builds or the guys that just got a couple cages, uh, I envy you. You guys, <laughs> you guys don't have to do all the hard work. <laughs> you guys don't have to do all the like the back breaking like Picture 15 water bowls, man, you know, oh, or yeah. 20 water bowls that that aren't water bowls at all. They're like huge kitty litter pans and, <laughs> and like, you know, so it's a, it's a lot of water, a lot of stench. Like, where am I yeah. going to put this, you know? And um, yeah, so I, I, I wish work was a little easier, but hey, it's all it's all for the animals and the love of the game, you know, <laughs> um, but for you know, getting back into your build as, you know, as we get into things, we kind of get into little tangents and um, they're hopefully all related to that subject and on, you know, that, that part of the build. But, you know, so now we're getting into your hooking it up and now we're above the soil. We're no longer at your heated soil. So hopefully if you guys happen to have any questions, this is a something you want to take into extreme caution. Heated soil, moist water, uh, cords down there, or um, me telling you to put a heat pad down there, you know, that's because that's what I'm doing. Um, it needs to be protected. Those yeah. heating elements are, are possibly dangerous, and if you're not doing it correctly, um, you can obviously catch fire or, or something worse, something like that, you know, and just... Right. Uh, lose your animal or something more horrible, lose your home. Um, what I really recommend is, is as I've taken all these ideas from like a, a bin in a bin or my sleeve um, or someone's uh, heat pad on the side of a bin or, or someone's uh, actual using a cane mat that's set to a thermostat 
uh, buried or something like that or side mounted to a wall all of these are what some of us are using like it's mm -hmm. just ideas that everybody in the hobby um has thrown out there all, everything is used like i think rob rob foster posted his white throat lane the other day and he had a really old dog mat i couldn't even remember the company he told me because i don't even know if it exists <laughs> so, um it's like uh or i think it's a radiant panel or something like that and i i to be honest i couldn't tell you i'd have to really go back and that's actually a few weeks but it's something that he has on the side of a bin and it's just side mounted to the wall and i have the same very similar thing but a smaller build um it's just not it's not like four by three like that heat pad was um and so being safe and being on top of your wires and where they are are important um, right. Okay, now here's a, a very important tool that I think I think can be left the way it is or modified to be even um, a greater tool in the in the hobby to use. And I haven't developed it yet, but I, I think it's going to be pretty simple. All it is is just a, a heat pad connected to a box. But it's a, a sleeved box, you know. It has one Protected. sleeve on the side, yeah. Right. But um, if you're thinking about doing the bin in a bin method, it is a heat pad taped to a bin, and then that is set inside another bin to protect the heat pad. Okay, that is one of our safest methods that anybody can recommend you currently. Um, right. Even even my sleeve method is. It's still a prototype. I've only been using it myself. Um, other people have different things. And, you know, you, let's say you use, uh, you applied um, reptile heat cable, right? That's like a 12 foot, 16 foot, 20 foot cable. I forget, right? It's pretty long. Mm -hmm. um, picture you ran that on a wall section and then you covered that with a piece of uh, metal, like sheet metal right and the sheet metal will carry the heat pretty well because it absorbs right. heat pretty well and transfers really well put a thermostat on that and it only gets to 90 degrees turns off that's also another gold ticket if you want to apply like it's just ideas you know you're just any any of these things are just ideas and you try them i've actually tried that one myself uh, uh, i didn't like it too much i didn't like the sheet metal in the enclosure um, it also allows quite a bit of bedding to get back there. But mm -hmm. as the ideas grow, you kind of utilize different, you know, different things is if, if they don't work out too well, or you see, oh, there's a flaw in this, you want to do it better. You're trying to, yeah, it's the, the heating the soil method is key for a lot of people's success with breeding monitors. Yeah. That's exactly hundred percent for me. If my soils were seventies or, or, or if there were 90s, my monitors wouldn't lay. It'd have to be 84 something. Yeah, right. That's that's my that's that's where my animals lay. If I dig up bins all the time, it's roughly always around 84, and that's my my incubating number as well. That's what I incubate at. Yep. Uh, yeah. I'm 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 aiming for mid 80s um, for my well. <sighs> With my nest, when when I have bins, they usually cover gradient about eighty-seven down to eighty, and for the most part, wherever the monitor starts to dig, it's it's right in that mid-eighty, about eighty yeah. or eighty-five degrees where they eventually nest. Um, and then with my larger enclosures, the corners do get down lower, but for the most part, the animals still nest in those areas that hit 85 yeah. 84 85 degrees yep so yeah it is key now i'd like to really get into just um some not really questions but there are questions that i run across all the time or they're they're, they're run across in the hobby all the time you know um People ask about, uh, I guess, like, you know, how to hook up your 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 lighting. You know, mm -hmm. uh, for 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 me, like, I was helping uh, a gentleman that um, 
has like tree monitors and and stuff like that. Uh, my friend Trav, uh, he he was doing a build, and you know a lot of the stuff was just available at um, at Home Depot, but you, you're you obviously you have to piece all of it together. Um, I use 16 gauge ceramic plate. Uh, and those are my two ingredients. I cut the female part off, you know, split it, split the wire, do what I need to do, um, bring it out, and then I apply it to my enclosure. And then, I mean, sorry, I apply it to the, the ceramic heat pla plate after I've ran the wires through the enclosure. And I'll use, you know, electrical tape, cover up the screws after I've, I've applied the wires, and I'll screw it in. Now, um, that's how a lot of enclosures are being done, but I believe there's a safer way where there's that little, I don't know, what's that, that space between it? It's like a grounder or something like that? Or Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, help me out here because I actually don't have none of those hooked up at all. So, <laughs> so you're uh, talking about basically that little round um, plate. Yeah, plate insulating piece basically yeah. that provides the uh, – space between wherever you're whatever you're mounting the actual light socket to um it creates a space so that wire um can pass through it can exist basically without touching anything else so you have your top of your cage you have this piece and then you have the ceramic fixture on the bottom of that and that's just an added safety measure um because I unfortunately I have had a cage actually catch on fire using just the uh, ceramic socket fixture with wires. Two, yeah. and I, I've done a lot of these, so yeah. this was only one time, but it was enough for me. Yeah. Um, where it was mounted to wood, basically, and I don't know if it was because uh, where it was mounted was um, I drilled through or I cut through the melamine. It was one of those old cages the melamine cages and over time the uh the little particles it's basically Sawdust. yeah i think yeah. something happened it got in there I, of course it was burned so i i couldn't yeah. really tell i'm not a uh uh, uh one of these arson analysis but you For know me, my, I, my bad one was uh um uh, me uh spinning the wire on top and then oh and man I, yeah so but it was cool i caught it i was there yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, yeah, that was a uh, you know it's like a little heart attack though. So we, yep. we want you, want you guys to be careful. Um, oh, just recently, yeah, just, I saw uh, Ryan McVeigh. He actually posted. Oh a picture. yeah, that Did you was. See a, that? Uh, and uh, most of you guys might be able to relate to this. It was the post on Reptile Lighting Group. Okay, yeah. and essentially it was a whole ceramic setup, right? And it, it kind of looked decent but it was hooked up to a plastic bin Dude, you're, gonna, <laughs> and, you're gonna melt that you're gonna destroy stuff those fumes are gonna be toxic yeah. to your animals i mean and it's just so yeah. much danger so um just just be really careful you know i don't want you to even though we're talking about rigging and utilizing anything uh, I, I guess yeah it's not it doesn't cover that though. okay it, it, yeah. uh, i want you guys to be careful and not not you do dumb things or like don't daisy chain and like hook all right. your stuff up to one um one extension cord and run off of one extension cord and connect a bunch of extension cords to one not don't do that stuff like you know just um it, it is going to be something that you're going to have to learn and hopefully you're not learning through poor experiences right um that we had to from, well. so, <coughs> learn from know, us learn from those other horror stories us. out there yeah there's uh there's 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 plenty of YouTubes and tutorials and people that can possibly help you. Right um, now, this is where I, I had I had a lot of help. It was never oh I, I'm going to go to Home Depot and just uh, just study all the stuff I need to do. No, it's because right. someone else recommended me, and uh, I went and I tried to find it and I applied it. That's that's what I did. And if you can, I mean, you can come to us. Uh, you can, you're, we're always like an open book if you feel like you need to ask us uh, any type of questions as far as relating to a certain builds. Um, like we do things a little bit differently than just just everybody else or like what the community is, is uh, expecting of you or stuff like that. We're trying to do just the, ball, the whole broad spectrum from uh, what we used to know and what we're trying to know, you know, and try to blend all that stuff together. Yep. 
So, man, this is a huge topic. And like we had talked about, we might split it into two. But where do you want to go next in this? I mean, they're... we're still we're still barely at the ground and nesting and heating right. stuff. So and electrical safety is electrical, key. Yeah. So because that's where I'm basically flowing through how I would build a cage. So yeah. you guys are going through, you know, my my mental flow of, all right, well, what's next? And so that would have been it. It'd be my skeleton the walls making it sure that it was going to be waterproof the lip the door your electrical stuff and then all that other stuff is your choice so you know if you want to be like okay again design between my simplicity but not prettyness or someone's pretty but not so functional and mm-hmm. I guess the end result here is functional and pretty. So, right. you know, I, I don't have too many pretty enclosures. I really just have what is functional for me and what I think works great for my animals. Um, you know, as far as without without stricking them from stuff, like I still allow them to climb on the walls and vertical hang and do things like that, right? I'm not just keeping it like bare bones, but... I'm not using like cork wall on every enclosure. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. It's on a lot of enclosures, but I use um, like fencing material, plastic fencing material that I hang and um, I I hang, uh, you know, just things like that where you're uh, utilizing and just pinning up stuff where they can, they can work with it. Um, Right. And everything is just, a bunch of cork tubes or a bunch of growing plants. Now I have dying plants in the enclosure <laughs> and I have dying <laughs> roots and dying leaf litter and um, bioactivity. And now we get into this. Okay. My bioactivity keeps me from changing poop too much or changing right. out the soil too much. And it turns average soil into rich soil where shoot you can plant anything in it i guess eventually um but now, it, now kai what is your bioactivity uh my bioactivity is my base okay you're you're starting you have to start somewhere that's not what you want and um i want sandy loam but um not everybody can just go and buy sandy loam you have to make that or you, you can get it specifically from some random place maybe that's mm-hmm. like a lumber yard or a rockery um, but even then they may not have it. So it's sand and the eco earth as your base core. But um, I'm also adding uh, um, like twigs and stuff like that. And right. that's going to eventually break down. My leaf litter will break down all with it. And eventually that'll give me my sandy loam type feel, which is just a sandy soil. Uh, now I add like twigs, little twigs that are, coming on the branches so it adds structural support to my nest nesting areas but i also added to just all over the enclosure because it just holds the burrows good for them you know Mm -hmm. and uh, now i have random red worms or earthworms kind of melt (laughs) no i don't put earthworms in there um and uh i have isopods powder oranges, powder blues, and some random ones I caught outside. But those random ones right. were amazing. And they're yeah. big. Yeah, yeah, they're like they're like a almost a dime size, you know, like a two Skittles or something like that. That's how big are, they are. Are they those um the basically like the light gray? Yeah, they're like uh, magnum something. I forget what they're called, but not yeah. roly polies, but the actual they're roly, they're big roly polies, man. They're like oh, a yeah? Yeah. See, I got one that look kind of like roly polies, but they're flatter. They can't roll into a ball like a roly poly. No, uh, no. This, these are, these can still roll into a ball, but they're also flatter. Like there's like the Volkswagen shaped one, and there's like the flatter one. I have both. <laughs> Man, I, I, I need to find out which ones I have. That's my. You know? I can even send you some because I all I have to do is just put soil in a cup, and there's a ton in there. But, um, you know that's that's my bioactivity and. That's uh, breaking stuff down for me a lot faster um, <coughs> than, than most than uh, than most of I don't know other other uh, other setups or something like that. I, I try to 
try to keep their their areas like i apply a lot of stuff just for those isopods and and spring gels and stuff i mean so, naturally in, in the enclosure already it's supported for them you know so i made a comment earlier to and this is i i should clarify <laughs> You know, sometimes I see posts, I see people asking about setting up new enclosures and they want to use a certain isopod. And I made the comment, like, are you keeping a lizard or are you keeping bugs? Not every isopod is going to work for you. OK, um, yeah. you need to figure out what's usable, what's not, or just start off on focusing just on the animal and play around with stuff afterwards. But I've seen people, unfortunately, structure a cage build or the inside of a cage towards keeping plants and keeping you know bugs alive yeah monitors they're messy yeah, they, they're destructive they that stuff up right that that might not be the best for you and so i have seen people struggling to keep live plants and and bugs in their enclosure rather than focusing on keeping the animal the the actual captive in there which is your lizard alive or doing well I would say Kai's been doing this a while. Um, he's been able to mess around and play with some stuff that works. And so I'm glad you're sharing that information. But for, for newer keepers, you know, just, just focus on the animal first and yeah. get into like, that stuff. Get a, get an you. isopod that's, that you don't care about. Like, right. It's don't just, go spending a hundred dollars on a cup of powder oranges that are like 15 bucks. That's right. like the most prolific. You know, it's it's just those the, those types are, are going to be beneficial for you for for speed. Sure, they may not be the prettiest, but they're doing the job. You know, they get a mm -hmm. decent size. So you can see them. But, um, yeah, man. And now oh, there we uh, go. I just had to touch on that real quick. <laughs> yeah, no worries, man. Now, as far as uh, other uh, questions that I get as far as builds. Right. Um, I actually had uh, a gentleman talk to me about like um just the stuff around the the like placement uh around the lamps mm -hmm. um for me i try not to have anything around the lamps um nothing that they can like, swing on and hang on or a cage around the bulb um like this gentleman had a, like a rig set up where it was kind of um like a prong setup and there was like three or four bulbs that you can plug into the thing and um he really asked me like wh what i thought about it right um now what i what i like is something that doesn't have a bunch of limbs and stuff on it and that's what this mm -hmm. thing had and so when you applied it it basically allowed a surface area that the monitor is going to jump on and grab on or hang up there and and just get into the lights you know um right for me to try to keep it where it's just the fixture and the bulb and it's centered away kind of sort of from everything else and they can't right. really get to it they, i mean they they could get to it but it's not a jungle gym for them to play in you know and so um i recommended this gentleman kind of put like a frame around it where it still exposed the bulbs but it protected it from getting up there now i just want to keep your animals from getting burned up there or right. ripping out bulbs ripping out light bulbs is uh man a knucklehead monitor is fun that's what yeah I, like, yeah that they just i'm just they're just going to be up there and they're just ripping it out of the socket um it's crazy it's like they don't want it to be <laughs> yeah, i don't know but um and so you know these, these are just a couple questions that i see with the the lighting thing i'd really want to get um get more more into the lighting um as far as you know just just what people can possibly relate to uh, I have and use the ceramic socket with like 40 watt and 50 watt bulbs. Maybe the max I use is 75 watt bulbs. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't use any hotter. Now, how I'm trying to do math calculations between my whole enclosure, um, you may have to just plug in some bulbs and then, all right, it's like, dang, it's too hot. And so you're going to change it. You know, those are those are some just good things to work with. there. just testing stuff out. You know, you want to just get an idea on what you think would heat this enclosure up, apply it and then seeing how that how that affects it and then adjust from there. Um, now, dang, brain fart. 
<laughs> well, you know, you're, you're bringing up light bulbs. And one like of the a, things that um, you mentioned is I, I try to use the lowest watt bulb to accomplish yeah. what I want to do. Not the highest and definitely not um, a high watt bulb on a uh, some yeah, kind you of got me, switch. Got me back on track. Thanks, yeah. man. No, no. Uh, sorry, man. Well, what, I was, <laughs> what I was almost almost about to finish saying was, you know, um, basically like you, like like you're pointing out, uh, my high wattage bulbs. I'm not really trying to utilize that, but let's say it does take a 150 watt bulb to heat up the whole enclosure. I'm splitting that into like three 45 watt bulbs or three 50 watt bulbs. <laughs> Having some technical so, difficulties there. So, uh, you know, basically splitting your bulbs out and having a bank of, 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 of lights is perfect. That's what we kind of yeah. recommend, especially for the bigger guys, the bigger monitors that are going to be, you know, several feet long and uh, right. one and two bulbs is not enough. And even three to four bulbs is barely kicking it. So, you know, if you have a, a, a good row of stuff, I kind of then start just spreading out that heat, kind of spreading out the, 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 the bulb, is, the bulb watches as well. Right. Equaling up to what it took in one big bulb. That's how I kind of work it out. Yep. Um, I always start with just 30, 45, 50 watt bulbs. And I kind of go up from there if I need to and adjust. Um, I kind of have like a summer summer type bulb and a winter set bulb, but they're roughly all around the same. Um, now, this part is where it's going to take a little while. You might need to let your cage sit for 24 hours, 48 hours, and let your cage go through the days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, if whether you want to run it with soil and stuff or – or you don't, and you just want to run it dry and get a, get an idea of your your temperatures. Um, run it, run it with different bulbs, and this is where you're you're now going to start applying other stuff to the wall, uh, and and where you're going to put your logs and and things like that. I have most of the stuff elevated and hung off the floor, so things are are mounted, roped, uh, fish hooked hung to the side but nothing sits on the floor the floor is actually a whole level itself <clears throat> and you know uh, when you guys start getting into this i'm sure kai's done it but you will spend hours at home depot or lowe's just or looking at list. yeah just looking at different devices to hang whatever you want different hooks different ideas on how to do this stuff um we've done it just it's gonna happen once you start building the cage you're going to look for these little, those eye hooks. Do you want to use eye hooks or do you want to fasten it to the top of the cage this way? Hang it from a chain. How do you want to do? Yeah. We're I all use doing this. <laughs> rope. And you, know, you know what's weird is I just use white twine rope, but I used to, because I, I, at one point I didn't want to buy any of that stuff because I just didn't have the money or something. I use old shoelaces or the shoe, the extra shoelaces that they gave you in the shoes. Yeah. And just tied those up. Yeah, man. Just there's anything laying around you can use almost. I've used um gosh, paracord. Um I've I've gotten away from it, but I have used it. I'm using chains now. I've used high gauge like fishing line. Um yeah. Adjustable. Or, Adjustable. Yeah, then right, you know, right. tie it up there and then get if I need to um, bring it up some more, choke it up. If I need to, get lax it and give it some some more rope and have it come down. And that's how that's how my uh, most of my logs hang. They don't yep. sit on the ground really. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things I I was doing at first, and it wasn't a permanent fixture anyway, but I was actually hanging things from their cords, and it is not a good idea. And because one of the reasons is there might be too much weight or just weight overall, or if you got a monitor hanging from a dome inside of uh, that weight from the animal, uh, it might start to pull that cord, you know, from the actual fixture. And then you might have a failure, which in my case happened. Um, so definitely have another way of suspending that rather than just the cord, have a, have a safety device in there, um, 
at a fixed length because also with a cord, let's say you have a six foot cord, you have a foot of that cord hanging in your, your cage and there's some slack. Well, if there's some way for your monitor to pull that, that, that light fixture down and pull the cord down, you could find your light fixture on the ground. You could find it on top of, um, on top of something, hopefully not the animal, but it's, it's plastic. one of these ideas. What's wood, that? Yeah. Or have a bold land on plastic or wood or something. Right. Right. Yeah. And now you're, you're hurting. So it's one of my fears, actually. I, I'm not using PVC in a whole lot of um, cages yet, but I want to. But it is one of my thoughts and one of my um, hesitations. Melting. Yeah, is melting that um, that PVC, uh, not only for the fumes, because there are fumes when you get it up to that degree and you're melting it um, that are toxic, but also um, <clears throat> an escape. I mean, a lot of these animals are investment animals. And the last thing I want to do is lose an animal. So um, just some varying thoughts you know as i'm kind of thinking along yeah. these lines well now i guess uh as you brought up uh pvc enclosures um it'd be good to talk about that now too it's probably probably a good last segment possibly before uh before we uh make a part two if you yeah. like or we'll keep going but the current situation in the united states um and i'm not sure what it's like around the world but uh there is a major uh major fluctuation in the price currently for wood and so our alternative right now for something that's reasonably priced structurally build all that stuff like that um looks decent as well and it actually has a, some more pros to it as well but um pvc built enclosures mm -hmm. are probably going to be the new thing on the rise now that current current wood enclosures are are sort of uh just it's too expensive, expensive to make yeah. yeah, so um, as people are either raising their prices just because they have to now make money with the current cost of stuff, um, you know, people are going to go elsewhere. So um, I, I expect uh, more and more PVC stuff to be done, maybe some better enclosures. I've seen a lot of stuff. Now, some cons, okay? Might as well put them out there. Um, if it's thin and you need a lot of soil and it's a large enclosure, it'll blow. Right. Okay. Um, if it doesn't have a great track on it, the tracks a lot of times are plastic, and if it's you know if you good and have a good track on it, it'll it'll last. But those little thin ones, like that I got from AP, I had to actually um, add um, silicone to it so that way the the tips on the ends wouldn't break just because they were so fragile. Mm -hmm. um, so you just want things to be more structurally built, better to support monitors. A lot of those PVC enclosures were built to just do snakes, small stuff, you know, lightweight stuff. Um, now, uh, I find this a con, um, but um, some people may not if their cages absorbs it right. But uh, I find that the humidity gets trapped really well in a PVC enclosure. Yes. So if you don't have great air convection and stuff like that, or some good ventilation at least, um, it's going to have a lot of water droplets all at the top. And I hate that because then I think it gets into like water sockets or um, it's it's just unpleasant as you're opening an enclosure and it's just a whole bunch of water dripping. And so you then have to uh, adjust on your humidity levels within the soil. And I what I was doing was just keeping the soil more dry because the humidity was kept so high in that enclosure. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was my adjustment on on that. But then it also had some bad effects, too, because the soil was a little bit too dry. Um, you know, now, uh, you know, you talked about the whole melting thing. And um, I hope that, you know, now they're built for good usage of where to put a heat lamp in them. I think some are built with mesh tops or mesh little cut out, right? Right. Uh, I think, and then I, I and I know some people are mounting them inside the enclosures. Um, I, I was mounting them the inside the enclosures, but but I put a piece of plywood in between the the fixtures and the actual PVC ceiling, mm -hmm. so you know, they were on that. Um, but you know, just uh, just the scare of 
the heat and all that melting that you know i use low wattage bulbs so they don't really get too hot you know but picture if it was a someone putting 150 watt or 250 watt on there they get extremely hot you know right um now some uh, some pros stuff's really lightweight makes lifting and doing stuff yeah. simple uh keeps things light and easy to log around or um you know you don't have to break your back doing stuff because yep. we're getting old and I'm already tired from digging sand. <laughs> so I don't want to have to log cages around. And sometimes it's just by myself, you know? Yep. Um, and those PVC enclosures work really well. Um, you know, I, uh, I wish uh, there's there's a few companies doing it. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, no worries. just off the top of my head, there's a few of these PVC enclosures or PVC cages that actually have like an aluminum frame to them. Um, I think it's like... Uh, I forget the the name of it, but it's um, yeah, it's just your square frame, um, and I would be a lot more willing to try something like that. Uh, so it has some some more um, structural integrity, yeah. you know, to it uh, for monitors. It just seems to make sense to me because <clears throat> one of the things I have a hard time getting past is um, there are companies out there that will chemically weld. Um, the insides of the the PVC cages, which is great, but then some of these you're going to pay sometimes just as much in shipping for some of these cages as you yeah. are for the cage itself. And That's if they the send it, part. yeah, if they send it built like that, where the the corners are chemically welded, then it's already have it already has to be built. And then for some of your larger cages, you're looking at like freight shipping charges and mm, it's um, thousands. Right, hundreds, hundreds, or thousands of bucks because of the size, and um, may not be uh, may not be great on the cost at all. Right, you know, even right. if uh, even if it's cheaper than wood. So dang, <laughs> reptile reptile keeping just went up, man. Yep, shoot, all that cost. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's just gonna, it's just nuts. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, oh, hobby. Oh, the now let's say like the with the PVC with the whole build let's say like an eight by four right mm -hmm. the back wall is going to need a brace yes if it's not built thick and i don't know if they're even built that thick um so it'll need a back brace and the front too will need a brace too and depending on how the doors are made um and so you just basically need a some type of pole or rod that runs from the bottom all the way to the top and it just keeps it from bowing and then at the base of your very large enclosure, depending on how much soil you use, it'll bow from the sides as well. Mm -hmm. And if it's not built well enough, um, you have issues with sand and soil pressing against the wall and having it bow that way. Yep. So, yeah. And you, wanna... you know that's been a lot of my hesitation in, in getting into them so far and using them. <laughs> yeah, that's I why know... wood wood is still my go-to still. Right. Right. I know that three fourths um, thick PVC is stronger than like the half inch or the quarter inch. Um, but still, you know, these things are being held together in some cases just by screws. screws um, yeah. And so all that pressure is just being put on those screws. Um, and I'm, I'm just a little hesitant still. So I wouldn't be as hesitant to use it in like a, your four by two um, size enclosure but when you start getting to the larger ones like you were just talking about you know they're gonna yeah. need some some braces some extra yeah, basically made for a monitor lizard right because of what you need to do to it yeah now uh, i had a guy um he had a cage like that built for him but the insides mm, what I say is just get the stuff, the, the box built for you, and you add all the stuff yourself later. Yeah. Um, maybe if he did a shelf for you, but, man, depending on the size of the lizard species, he, if that shelf isn't adjustable, it's just going to be a shelf, you know? Maybe stuff that you, you, know, you lean stuff on, but may not be a great basking shelf. Like, it's, it just doesn't make sense to me if the shelf is – all the way to the right side and it's three or four foot down um, where the basking area should be like a foot or two away from the bulbs 
you know, in, in a general, in a good direction where the bulbs are basically over hovering over it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then you get a good distance of bulbs to play with, but uh, it's it's all it's all a working game if you utilize really big bulbs, or let's say you have a huge large enclosure and you have a large animal in there, and you're using large bulbs. Let's say your your community or where you live is really cold as well, so you have to use large large bulbs, right? Um, man, all that all that's going to change for you a little bit because we're talking about using lower wattage bulbs, but if you have to utilize something like 150 watt or three of them you know and if you have such a big lizard and your place is really cold in the winter time um mm -hmm. yeah adjusting for that is is going to be different because your mirror your, your bulbs and the space between it will need to be much greater um than just what we're recommending because we're, we're only talking about like br30s 35 watt 40 watt bulbs and pr um sorry par 38s as well that are still only 50 watts so right. they're not really that hot but when you get into using the 75s 100 150 watts the the strength on them the lumens on them is just much greater and so you have to use a bigger distance in between so it's got to make sense it's got to flow and i do i use some of the ceramic heat emitters in some of my big walk-in enclosures in the winter and um that's just to keep you know some sort because uh, of heat in there because uh, the ground temperature on the concrete surface can actually be 50 degrees um, in the winter, no problem. And like this, my I had my uh, one of my girls lay uh, on Christmas Eve. Um, I knew she was going to lay, so I needed to bump those temperatures up. And not to say that my cage was in contact with the concrete ground, but the bottom of the cage was still like 62 degrees without that bulb. So I needed to <clears throat> make a few adjustments with using some large um, slate pieces, basically setting up basking spots specifically. So they'll hit those slate pieces and the slate pieces will then radiate into the ground, uh, transfer heat into the ground. But then I also had to add in that ceramic heat uh, emitter in the middle of the cage just to keep the temperatures up. Um, so yeah, you might, and that, I think those were, I think they were a hundred watt. I'd have to check them. They might've been in the one fifties, but that's what I had to do in that, in that situation. I don't necessarily like that. So I'm going to mess with some ideas going into next season, um, just to set up either lower wattage, like almost like having my, my basking spots, but then also for the winter, having other spots that are just there to heat the soil. Uh, so to speak, you know, to yeah. give the soil a more uh, even gradient across it. Um, so, yeah, these are different ideas that I've had to play with or that I'm currently playing with to figure out. So, Nice, man. Shoot. Uh, I don't know. I'm just waiting for my partitions to come in. <laughs> yeah, to get the car cage with the partition built in it. And then I'll be done for for a little while as far as what I wanted to. To be honest, I'm kind of scared of all the whole wood thing, dude. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, will it go down? <laughs> I hope so. I really I mean, hope so. It's kind of too high. And then, all right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Man. We were talking partitions. We were talking price of wood. You know, current. Yeah, I'm and, trying uh, not to <laughs> have the the price. Uh, price hurt me so bad man i know cage that would cost only 200 before is now costing me five six seven hundred right yeah and you know get creative if you guys have stuff laying around figure out how to use it sometimes you might have to change the dimensions of your build um based on what you have and i've been one of those guys i've went around and shopped to like when you have a new neighborhood going up new apartment complex and making some friends, you know, maybe bring over a case of uh, cold ones and uh, let somebody take them home. And, and they might let you go through the scrap pile and you can pull out some good pieces of wood out of there sometimes. Now, your uh, your outside doesn't really matter because the inside is going to be lined with something else. And that's going right. to be your water protecting. So you can have rustic looking wood that you sanded and used. Or yep. you can have like all different kinds of wood. Shouldn't make a difference because your end result should have 
it should be like lined and covered with stuff and painted right. with something where it's protecting that wood. So, um, yeah. All right, man. You, know, you want to stop there and yeah. uh, just wanted to see what else, what uh, um, what else you wanted to add to this. Oh man, see that's why it's hard to find a good stopping point because I think it will have to be sections cuz there's so much to talk about. I mean, and just for all the listeners out there, I've over the years I've built things out of uh plywood, um melamine particle board trying to protect the inside of it to to do yeah. it on the cheap. Um I think one time I even put together like one of those more industrial garage racks like you can get at Home Depot. I'm using those currently for different things. But the idea I had was um, the little notches on the side where you put the shelves. I actually bought these heavy duty like uh, ball bearing um, casters like like you have on drawers, um, the sliders, you know, and I figured out a way to bolt these things onto the sides of these uh, garage racks. And then so I tried to build like this pull out system uh, using I think I was using like greenhouse plastic and plywood and everything. Um, it could work with someone with a lot more skill, but <laughs> it ended up just being a big waste of money. <laughs> yeah. So we, I'm sure we both have a couple of those. Some stories. ideas are a waste of money. <clears throat> just. Yep. Uh, yeah. Oh, man. Hey, there's a <clears throat> I'm a weirdo. So everything that i see on the street or like everyone <laughs> or like i walk into a building right right and i see like a, a an enclosed glass area and I, i'm just looking dude that can be an enclosure <clears throat> you know or uh um i'll see like the security box where yeah. they're sitting in a window right and they're either taking tickets or allowing you to go in that's like a perfect enclosure oh, all man. it just needs to be modified um, yeah, or like, um, uh, there's these, uh, personal booths. I used to work for a company where I would have to deliver things and, uh, they would, um, they, you, you really, it's like just some it company and all their conversations were private, but in these little tiny booths, right? Mm -hmm. So you can either sit in there with them or you can sit in there and you're talking to them through the internet or through Skype or whatever, right? And, um, um and these whole little units were like i don't know like like five by five by ten or something like that or yeah like six by six by ten tall and uh they were i mean they looked just like, man like who makes those right <laughs> and uh, I've, yeah they're built so well i've looked at those those big boxes that they use for moving stuff sometimes or um like something they'd ship a like a shower stall fixture in yeah. uh, or a hot tub, you know, these huge boxes that I'm like, hey, you guys throwing that out? <laughs> you got a truck I can borrow, too? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You get I mean, getting creative is what we really want people to understand with building. Right. Um, there it's kind of like a goal, but there's there's so many ways to get there. So, right. You know, you want to, you want to, you want to, if you got an idea, let's say your, 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 your skill has something to already do with it. Or like, let's say you're good at woodworking or, or you are, dang, I'm trying to, trying to. Yeah. You have some, you know, someone like some skill or like you're great with resin already. Right. And, and right. you've done stuff with it already and you can, you now know how to utilize things. I don't know, but basically your, your job, um, your real, real job, like actually has skills that you can utilize for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and apply those. Man, Man you, you know, a, another thing that, I, uh, you know, we'll have to do a part two because we yeah. got to get into some of these, these um, mistakes on measuring, cutting, how you want to actually fit pieces together. Uh, you know, a common one I, I've done myself and I see other people is just because you want to build a, let's say a two by six enclosure where it's two, uh, six by two by two. Uh, you can't just staple those pieces together. You actually got to uh, measure for the, 
the thickness of the plywood that you're using. So, you know, you uh, actually lose it. Yeah. <laughs> you lose space. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's do a part two. Let's, um, yep. let's pick it up where we left off and get into a few more. Maybe we can retouch on a few things if we need to um, explain them a little more, but yeah, let's talk about those different um carpentry skills we've learned on the fly to make some of this stuff work and how to put these things together i don't have no carpentry skills at all yeah i didn't i don't yeah, start I just, with it i just uh, i just uh man i just i just i just drill it and go yeah. <laughs> okay and, my, my my carpentry skills like sure i know how to use the drill and stuff but i mean dude I, i'm like my cuts i gotta measure like three or four times make sure yeah. And um oh, and use the same tape measure, people. If you're measuring something, use the same tape measure. Sometimes I don't have uh you know all the tools, I just have the cutting stuff, right? And yeah. so like I wish I can just uh, router stuff or make a uh, great corner edges and and do things that way, make it look nice, but no, nah, I got I got a right. guy I got a guy to help me do that. I just draw it up and help him. That way, uh that way we're all on the same page. Right. And some things for the bigger pieces, you need a table saw and you yeah. got to know about cutting with the grain and against the grain and using these different, you know, methods to keep yourself safe. And do you have another person there to catch the wood on the other side so it doesn't buck and fly off on you um, in there? Chipped a tooth doing it. You guys can't see it, but uh, it's there. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So getting into a cage building is gonna take a lot out of you, but I guess that's that's what makes that's what just makes us dedicated keepers, you know. You're willing to yep. go through it. And it's something that you didn't you thought you were keeping lizards, but really you're now a carpenter. Yep. You know, so. electrician, possibly a plumber. <laughs> and as you build them, you get real good at those caulk lines along the edges too. You get you develop that little system where it won't look all jagged and you know. Uh, yeah, out of your, place. your seams look better. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, man. I can't, uh, can't really get enough uh, of uh, of all the stuff that I get to learn as I'm making cages and just yeah. just uh, things to improve on. But um, yeah, I think uh, we'll have uh, part two. Uh, we'll uh, round up more questions that are regularly asked as far as cage building. Um, I get them all the time. To be honest, I'm not really hitting on a bunch of uh, uh, on a bunch of ideas at the moment, but I, I know there's a, a fair amount of ideas that that people are always asking me. I just gotta scroll through my messages and really pinpoint them out. Yeah, and to be honest, I and maybe an apology to the listeners and to you, Kai. Man, coming in to to record this, I think. About the first half an hour, you know, my brain was uh, I, I just dug up a clutch. It didn't go the way I wanted to. It wasn't it wasn't all a loss, hopefully, but yeah, it was heart wrenching. So, um, yeah. you know, I had to I had to kind of get into things real slow here. <laughs> yeah, man, monitor keeping and uh, doing that stuff is stressful. Sometimes I might not even be like in the mood to just to talk a bunch because I'm trying to think like, right. Oh, all right, man, what do I got to? What am I doing? What am I dealing yeah. with? Today? All right, who's who do I got to deal with today? Yep, and uh, figure stuff out. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> I hear you, man. I'm the same way. So after this, you know, I'm like, okay, what do I got to go back and do? That female that just laid, I got to get some food in her. Got to get her up and running, yeah. making sure she's good. Um, just a bunch of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and actually, what's funny is building cages. Uh, putting some stuff together, you know, where am I going to do this? How am I going to move that around? Um, finishing up. I got different parts of cages laying around that I need to finish up or redo to some degree. I think it's never ending to some, when you get into it, uh, when you start producing or you have a lot of animals. Yeah. It's never ending. Uh, a few jobs yep. on top of each other kind of get yep. what you could for the day. Some things you're not even able to do all at once. So. Right. Kind of right. Like and settle. So, all right man all right yeah let's wrap it up uh just again we want to say thank you to uh mpr and the morelia python radio network uh guys go ahead and check them out on moreliapythonradio.com 
scroll through, of course, you'll see uh, NPR. I think there's Colibrid Corner. Uh, there's the Field Herping Podcast. There's an Australian Herpetological Podcast. Uh, Carpets and Coffee. There's so much. Shoot. I so know good. I'm missing one or two also in there. Shame on me. But um, it's growing. So, yeah, give them a, give them a look. Go on the website. Um, look them up. There may, on- there may be stuff that you guys are interested in other than just monitors, too. So right. give, those guys a, give those guys a look. Um, we want to say thank you for the support so far as far as all the listeners that are um, supporting us and, you know, tuning in. Um, yeah. The feedback uh, has been great. Uh, we're trying to – Touch as many topics as we can, without mm-hmm. without having um, you know, without having like just the overload of information. Kind of try to have things flow, and I'm glad yeah. you guys are enjoying it. Um, you know, everything is is all from experience, and uh, it's what we've tried to gather. I'm glad you guys are loving it. And also, uh, something I haven't been mentioning, but I should. Not only get on and try to support uh, Morelli Python Radio through their Patreon. They have a $5 and a $10, but also U.S. Arc. And shame on me for not mentioning that. They're out there um, protecting our hobby uh, across the nation. They're doing a lot of good work, fighting battles, and uh, there's a lot to it. Um, I, I'm hoping someone actually does a, a U.S. Arc-specific show, uh, gets the – gets the guys that were originally part of putting this together and some of the battles they had to fight. One of them particular had to do with Aki's and it's an amazing story. Um, but hopefully one day we'll get to hear those stories from the people that lived it and uh, realize that they're here and we're keeping them because of those battles that were fought. I don't know, 20, 30 years ago uh, for some of these animals. So Go ahead, get on there, give. Uh, one way I'm doing it, if some of you are using some of these um, shipping uh, companies for your reptiles, you can add on um, to the packages you're shipping to donate to US Arc. I like doing it that way. Um, there's different level memberships, but yeah, protect us, protect what we're doing. You know, we want it around for not only our enjoyment, but for our kids, uh, different people we're bringing into it. So, um, it's great to have this information, put these podcasts out, but if we're not protecting what we have, then they're just going to be, you know, relics, uh, to some degree in the future. So, all right, Kai, you got anything else? No, um, uh, I guess the only thing is for our listeners, um, we'd like to get a little bit even more, um, I don't know, hands on or in, in inviting you guys um you know interact with us whether you want to ask us questions that um have answered on uh, on the podcast or if you'd like to come on for like a q a yourself or let's say if you have a certain species um you know feel free to message us uh, i think this is it's not real it, it is sort of uh you know a plug out there to see if anybody is willing to hop on you know um yeah we're definitely interested in having people that um, both we know and don't know as well. So, you know, if you're a stranger, uh, don't be a stranger. We've got a few that few people that are, you know, we don't really know too well at all or just, just message us out of the blue and uh, we're able to put their questions up on here and it was able to actually reach quite a few people just because yeah. it's all stuff you can relate to. Um, and that's the only way I think we'll be able to really – help each other is if we can share our experiences maybe someone can relate and we kind of just work work with each other that way yep all right all right you guys all right man thank you